I'm Adam Johnson, this is Nine Dots, and this is the Sony a7 III. In this video, I'm gonna tell you what I think of it, why I finally gave up on Canon, and how I've set it all up to be my, well, in my opinion, the greatest wedding photography camera of all time. Okay, first things first, I am a wedding photographer. So this review is from the perspective of shooting weddings. I'm also not particularly bothered about technical jargon or statistics which measure the performance of this camera in a scientific way. I know some people are interested in that though. So here's a screenshot of the DxO Mark scores of the a7 III, which rates it better than the Canon 5D Mark IV and the Nikon D750 in each of the measurements. And I'm sure that means it's the winner, even though I've no idea what each of those measurements mean. But if you're into those sorts of reviews and numbers and graphs, then I'd suggest you go nuts on the DxO Mark website. Enjoy. But this review won't be that. No, no charts, no scales, and uh, minimal jargon. This is just my real world experience of using this camera to shoot a lot of weddings. I always shoot only based on what I'm seeing in the viewfinder or on the screen. So I won't be talking at all about its metering systems. Sorry about that to all you Aperture Priority people. So first, uh, I'll give you a tiny bit of background. I started shooting weddings back in 2009. Uh, my first camera was a Canon, and every camera ever since then had also been a Canon, apart from a very short experiment with the Nikon D750, but hey, we all make mistakes. So yeah, uh, I've always shot Canon, and I was always happy. But a few years ago, I bought a Sony RX1R, which is Sony's little flagship compact full-frame camera. I loved everything about that camera, except a few things. First of all, the autofocus, which was frustrating, to say the least. It also had ridiculous tiny batteries, which lasted about 10 seconds. Uh, so when the a7 III was released, and it sounded like Sony had nailed the autofocus, I knew I had to try it, so I hired one. Now, when I hired it, I actually hired it because I wanted a new camera for taking on holiday, taking photos of my kids, and just taking on family days out to capture day-to-day -day life. I wasn't particularly looking to ditch Canon for weddings or work, but within 20 minutes of using this camera, I knew I was never going to shoot another wedding with Canon ever again. Uh, since then, I've shot 25 weddings with the a7 III. I've taken over 200,000 photos with it, so I think now is the time to tell you exactly what I think of it. So we'll start with the size and the weight. Now, a lot of people say their reasons for going mirrorless is for lighter, smaller cameras. And I couldn't really have cared less about the size and weight of the camera. And I actually have no preference whether my camera has a mirror or not. So the size, the weight, the mirrorlessness is not anything that ever bothered me. But as soon as I used the a7 III for even a couple of days, picking up the Canon 5D felt like lifting up a dumbbell. It's just ridiculously heavy and bulky and uncomfortable to hold. I've heard a few moans that people find the a7 III a little bit small and fiddly to hold, but I have to say I find it really, really comfortable to hold and use. The bodies themselves, in terms of weight, are only marginally lighter than the Canon 5D Mark IV and the Nikon D750, but the lenses I'm using are significantly lighter than the Canon lenses that I was using. The 85mm, uh, which is here, it weighs less than half of my old Canon 85 1.2, so that's pretty pretty significant. Um, while we're talking about lenses, I will show you what I've been using, as I guess that's pretty relevant to the rest of the review, uh, because lenses uh, play as much of a part in camera performance as the camera itself. So, uh, the main two lenses that I'm using are the Sony Zeiss 35mm 1.4 uh, and the Zeiss Batis 85mm 1.8, which is this one. Um, I also have the Zeiss Batis 25 f2 i can't show you the 35 1.4 because that's what i'm using to film this <laughs> but it's amazing i also have the sony zeiss 35 mil 2.8 this lens is a revelation it weighs 120 grams and the image quality in my opinion is just as good as the massive 35 mil 1.4 although it does have a slightly heavier vignette but that's easily fixable in lightroom for me, this is the perfect lens for taking on holiday or um, for using for personal projects or when you want to be really stealthy and inconspicuous at weddings. It's not cheap at almost £700 considering the size and weight of it, but I absolutely love it. Quick other thing to talk about with Sony is using other brand lenses. So I, when I bought this camera, also bought a Metabones 5 adapter uh, and I have used my old Canon lenses uh, on the a7 III using, the, uh, using that adapter. Uh, and I have to say, it's 
it's like using a different camera. The autofocus is slower, the camera feels unbalanced and heavy and slow, and it's just nowhere near as nice to use. So I did give up on that pretty quickly. In my opinion, the using Sony native and Zeiss native FE mount lenses on this thing is the only way to go. First thing I wanna talk about is the EVF, the electronic viewfinder. If you've never used an EVF before, then all you need to know is that it's life-changing. No more test shots, much less chimp in the screen to check your settings. And the best thing is that virtually no bad exposures, nothing underexposed, nothing overexposed. What you're seeing in your viewfinder is the shot you're gonna get if you press the shutter. And that's amazing. It also means you can experiment and play more than you were able to with an optical viewfinder because you can just see see what it's gonna look like before you even take a picture. So it's, it's not like you're taking test shots, you're just playing with settings and uh, and trying to find creative opportunities that you might otherwise have missed. The other thing that I love about the electronic viewfinder is that you can play back in the viewfinder itself. What that means is if you ever do want to check that a shot is sharp or well exposed or in focus, then you can do it without even taking the camera away from your eye, which I just think is amazing and it's especially useful on sunny days or you know when it's harder to see the LCD itself. To be able to check stuff in the EVF is it is insanely useful. There's absolutely no way I could ever go back to an optical viewfinder now. Moving on quickly to talk about the LCD itself. I've always thought of the camera screen as you know somewhere to check pictures and something that has live view. And the thing that, that changes when you have this camera is you don't really think of it as live view anymore. You think of it as having two viewfinders, one where you look through closely with your eye and one that you can see from a distance. Genuinely, I didn't expect to use the LCD much when I bought this camera. I thought I'd just keep, as I'd always been shooting, I thought I'd keep shooting using the viewfinder. Because I just thought, well, I've always had access to live view on the Canon and, and hardly ever used it. But now I use the LCD screen for about 90% of the shots that I take. I only really go to the viewfinder when it's, you know, really sunny or if I want to precisely check my exposure. You know, it's not the best LCD screen on the market, for sure. But, you know, we're not doing billboard shots or epic studio portraiture. It's the quality of the LCD is perfect for wedding photography. It also uh, tilts flips out, tilts up to about, well, just beyond 90 degrees, and it tilts down to around about 45 degrees, which you can see that, that's as far as it goes down, which is a little bit annoying. Uh, I wish it went a little bit further, um, and I, it'd be cool if it flipped out as well. But the fact it tilts at all means I'm definitely getting shots that I never would have seen or attempted without having a tilt screen. And for me, that was the biggest reason ever to switch to this camera from the 5D Mark III, because I knew I'd be able to go for shots that I just wasn't getting with the Canon. Well, you know, it's an amazing feeling to be thinking, oh, I'm getting shots with this camera that I wouldn't have got with my old camera. The LCD is more than an LCD, so it is a touch screen, and it's also a touch pad. And I'll tell you a bit about both of those features now. So the, the best thing about this, and the reason I use it almost all the time, is that wherever I want the focus to be, I can just tap the screen, and that's where it'll focus. It's way quicker and way easier than using this little joystick up here that also moves the focus points around. So yeah, just tapping it, tapping and focusing. Even better is that when, when you put your eye to the viewfinder, I can still tap the screen because it becomes a touch pad now. So the screen is, is switched off, but it's still responsive to touch, which means I can still tap the screen to set my focus point, even though my eyes to the viewfinder. And that for me is my favorite feature of this camera. The fact that I can just tap the screen and set my focus point, whether I'm using the screen itself or whether my eyes to the viewfinder, I can, I can still do it. The last cool feature of the touch screen and pad is that when you're in playback mode, all you need to do is double tap the screen to zoom in and you can drag the image around to check focus. Uh, it's just a feature that I absolutely love. Quick segue on the on the whole touchpad and LCD thing. I use these eye cups, and that's mainly for comfort because they're really comfortable against against your eye socket. But it's also for blocking light out of the viewfinder when I'm checking exposure. And I also use it because it means my face is further away from the LCD when I'm using the viewfinder, which makes the touchpad uh, much much easier to use. Silent shutter. Now this is a really uh, topical point for this camera. And for me, it is the biggest letdown of this camera, the si which is the silent mode. I thought this and the eye autofocus were the big reasons to use this camera. Uh, and honestly, that, that, they're the two reasons that I rented it in the first place to try it out and see what those features were like. But in reality, I hardly ever use either silent mode or eye autofocus. Um, I'll talk about the eye autofocus in a little bit, but the silent mode, because of the sensor technology, which I don't understand, suffers pretty badly from banding uh, in any artificial light that's flickering. So it's so badly, it, it flickers so badly that I don't trust it. 
uh, and as soon as I don't trust a feature on a camera, I just don't use it because then my judgment will be clouded by the fact that I'm thinking, oh, is it going to work? Is it going to band? Is it? So I just don't use the silent mode. I only use it in situations where I absolutely have to, knowing that I'm probably going to get some banding on the final images. So it kind of sucks. It's not particularly noticeable, but, but it's annoying enough that I just don't use it. I just don't use the silent mode. Um, and I quite like the sound of the shutter. So one um, option in the menus that I've switched on is something called E-Front Curtain Shutter. I don't know the technical ins and outs of what this, how this works or what it does, but it makes the shutter quieter and quicker. Apparently it does have some potential side effects according to the manual, but I've not noticed anything. So I just leave it enabled all the time because it makes the shutter quieter. The other huge issue with silent mode on this camera uh, is something called rolling shutter distortion. This, what this means is if you're, especially if you're shooting continuous and you're maybe moving the camera a little bit between shots or, you know, just focus, kind of recomposing around a moment, the movement you make with the camera will result in slight movement in the sensor, which will distort people. And it'll result in people with funny shaped heads, which is not ideal because we shoot people and in my experience, people don't particularly want funny shaped heads. So the banding and the rolling distortion just put me off using the silent feature at all, which is a huge shame. The Sony A9 uh, has different sensor technology, so it doesn't suffer the banding issue at all as far as I know. That is almost enough to make me upgrade, but not quite. And that's because of anti-flicker mode and money. Um, so what the A9 doesn't have that the A7 III does have is this miraculous anti-flicker feature. Uh, and when I say miraculous, I mean the first time I tried this feature in a, at a wedding in a barn with the weirdest flickering LED lights, I couldn't believe what I was seeing in the, in the final images. There was just no, no, none of that kind of flicker effect that you, could, that you, you get with that kind of lighting. Um, and remember, I'm talking about mechanical shutter mode here, not in silent mode. The silent mode and anti-flicker mode don't work together. So you can't put on silent mode and switch on anti-flicker. The camera just won't let you do that. So mechanical shutter mode and anti-flicker mode. Anti-flicker, since that day that I tried it out in the barn, uh, it's just, I just leave it switched on permanently in my cameras. I never switch it off. If you read the manual uh, again, it just say this feet the anti-flicker feature, it might increase shutter lag, but I've not noticed any lag. So uh, yeah, I just, I just leave it switched on. Another quick thing to talk about is steady shot or what some people call in-body image stabilization, or it seems to become a bit of a buzzword lately, IBIS. Uh, I do have steady shot switched on in the camera all the time. I see no difference in the shooting speed or performance between having it switched on or switched off, so I just leave it switched on. So yeah, before I get into talking about autofocus and the more detailed setup of the camera, I'll quickly mention battery life, because I know again, it's what Sony haters like to cite as one of the reasons they don't switch. The battery life, is amazing. Almost on a par, I would say, with my old Canon 5D Mark III. I used between two and four batteries per wedding. I swapped the first two batteries for fresh ones at dinner time, and then uh, by the end of the wedding, the, the two fresher batteries that I put in at dinner time have still got about half power left in them. So you know, in reality, I'm not even using four batteries per wedding. And just to put that into perspective, an, an, a wedding for me is an average of 10 to 14 hours and an average of seven to 10,000 shots. So there's, there's absolutely nothing wrong with the battery life, and there's absolutely no reason why battery life should put you off upgrading to this camera at all. All right, I'm gonna quickly uh, talk about custom buttons. So this camera is covered in buttons, and I remember getting out of the box and feeling a little bit confused and a little bit overwhelmed, thinking, what are all these buttons? What do they do, and how am I ever gonna work out and uh, what they do? But the magic of this camera is that you quickly realize that they will do whatever you want them to do, pretty much. So custom, custom buttons is, is nothing new to cameras. My Canon had some options to remap certain buttons to certain functions, but it was a fairly limited list. This camera has loads of options, which you can map to any of the C buttons, C1 to C4, and you can also remap other buttons to do different functions too, if you don't like the, the default setting for those buttons. Like there's a thumb wheel on the back, and you can remap three sides of that thumb wheel as well as the middle button to do pretty much whatever you want. There's got these AF on and AEL buttons at the top corner here. You can remap those buttons um, like I have done. I'll show you that in a little while. But that means altogether there's 10 different buttons on this camera that you have complete control over what they do. Um, and I just think that's 
absolutely tremendous. And actually, it's probably the biggest reason why it took me no time at all to get used to using this camera because it was set up in a way that totally made sense to me personally. I'll quickly show you through my custom button setup before I carry on, so let's just dive into the menu. All right, so the, to access custom buttons, you wanna to go to camera menu two, screen eight, and it's this top option. You've got uh, you've actually got three, well, four even options to set this different custom buttons on this camera. The top one is the custom keys for photos. The second one is custom keys for movies. And the third one is custom keys for if you're in playback mode. The only one I've amended though is custom key for photos. So we'll dive into there for now. All right, so you've actually got three screens of different buttons you can amend here. There's actually uh, 13 of them. I said 10 in the video, but it's actually 13, even better. Um, so I'll quickly whiz through what I've set mine to and why. The control wheel on the back I've set to aperture, which is just really to match what my Canon used to do. Uh, there's, if you click into any of these, you can change it. So the only three options, you've got different options for each button, really. Um, there's not that as many options for this button. So you've got aperture, shutter speed, ISO, uh, white balance, creative style, picture effects, or you can just leave it not set if you don't want it to do anything. I've got mine set to aperture. Uh, the custom button one, I've got set to what's called APS-C S35 slash full frame select. Um, long name for a really simple button that I call zoom in. So it, what, it, what it basically does is it can quickly converts the sensor to APS-C mode so you get to take advantage of that crop factor and the camera effectively zooms in for you. So I've got that set to C1, which is the button nearest the shutter. So if I very quickly, if, you know, if my position's fixed or I can't get closer to something and I'd quickly want to be able to zoom in, I can just quickly press that button which zooms in, I can get the shot, press the button again, and then carry on shooting back in normal mode. So having that button really close to the shutter, and I do tend to use that fairly often, is really useful. Same with custom button two, playback. So that I mentioned earlier about being able to play back images in the viewfinder, and having the playback button right next to the shutter, I find really, really fast, because it means I'm not having to kind of go looking for the play button. Uh, I can just quickly press play with C2, uh, check the image in my viewfinder, C2 again, and back to shooting. So really, really fast way to play back images in the viewfinder. Custom button three, recall custom hold one, or what I like to call the get out of jail button. C3 is the button on the left top shoulder of the camera. And what this camera is capable of doing is, is storing these custom holds, um, which is a set of settings that you want the camera to recall whenever you hit that button. So I've got it set to, I'll show you now Click if we click into there. You can set any of these settings that you want. So shoot mode, aperture, shutter speed, all the kind of usual settings you've got in there. Uh, I basically have this so that it sets the camera to almost full automatic mode. So it sets it into P mode, keeps it on continuous shooting, because that's the way that I shoot. Auto ISO, multimetering, automatic AF, uh, wide. So basically if, if I want to, if I need to react to a moment or get a shot very, very quickly, and I know my camera's not quite set for it, um, you just hit that button, you and it'll just enable all these settings, basically put the camera into auto mode for a second. You can get the shot, and then as soon as you let go of the button, the camera goes back to the settings you had selected previously. Um, so that is a, an amazing button that I call Get Out of Jail. Uh, custom button four, which is actually the delete button, on the back of the camera, ne right down next to the play button at the bottom of the back, I've got set for silent shooting. Like I mentioned, I don't sh use that mode very often, but it's useful if I do need to use it, just having it assigned to a button on the back of the camera. The multi SLC sensor button, which is the joystick, uh, is set to focus standard. Um, and that just sets the focus back to the middle of the screen. The center button, which is the center button of the of the thumb wheel on the back, I've got set to white balance. I use that really often because I'm always working with manual white balance and I set the Kelvins up and down throughout the day. The left mode I've left to the default, which is drive mode. So I can select between the, the high plus 10 frames a second, high eight frames a second or slower if I want to. I've set the, the right button default is ISO and I've left that, but I've also set the down button to ISO because I find it really quick that, that I know that I can hit down to access the ISO menu and then keep hitting down. So my, it's just that one button. So down enables the ISO uh, options and then keep pressing down or up um, to change the ISO. I just find it really quick to have that on the down button. These, t these two buttons, AEL and AF on, 
uh, is basically back button focus. So I've swapped them around. So normally AF on would be AF on. <laughs> uh, I've changed it to IAF because I shoot with my left eye. So that button is a little bit more fiddly to access than the AEL button. So I have AEL set to AF on, which is basically back button focus. I have AF on set to IAF because I don't use that all that often. Um, and the, a the AF on button, like I say, is just a because I'm a left eye shooter, is a little bit more fiddly to access. Focus hold button, I'll be honest with you, I've no idea what the focus hold button is or where it is, so I've left it assigned to focus hold. But that's my custom buttons. So beyond those custom buttons, you can also set various other shortcuts within the camera, including the options which come up when you press the little FN button on the back here. Um, and you can also have the option to create custom menus at the end of the menu screens with the with any options that you find yourself going and looking for most often in the menus like format, date and time, and that kind of stuff. Um, so let's have a little talk about menus because it's a little bit of a bugbear for some people. This camera has a lot of menu options, a lot. And whether they make sense or not is a matter of opinion. A lot of them don't. They, the names just make, you know, they, the, the names don't seem to really tell you what the option does, uh, unless you go and check the manual. And let's be honest, who reads the manual? But this is one of those cameras where you kind of need to read the manual. I'm going to quickly whiz through the menu um, and talk you through some of the options that I've switched on and off and why I've switched them off. So let's dive into the menus again. All right, this is the menus. I'm not going to talk through every single possible menu option because that'll be an hour long video in itself, but I'm just going to talk you through some of the main options that I've changed or that I would recommend you change. So this first screen is the quality and image size. Uh, I shoot RAW mainly, but I, the reason I shoot RAW and JPEG in camera is because the Sony RAW files don't include a full size JPEG preview within the RAW files. So if you're culling your RAW images into something like Photo Mechanic, all you'll see is a low res version of the image and I think that just, that just makes culling a bit less uh, a bit not as you know not as nice of an experience because you're seeing these low res images so if you shoot J raw and jpeg photo mechanic would show you the jpeg so you see a better quality image while, you, while you're culling so these would be my settings for raw and jpeg uh, compressed raw just because it's a smaller file size and you, I don't know it's any lot difference in quality uncompressed is massive raw files and I just don't think I need those uh, JPEG fine and 10 megapixel is enough for the what I was talking about, the photo mechanic experience. We'll skip forward. Anything I can turn off that the camera does, uh, I turn it off generally. Things like long exposure, noise reduction, high ISO noise reduction, switched off. Just because they the, the only thing they affect is JPEGs uh, and the JPEG previews. So you'll be tricked when you're playing back images in your viewfinder or on your LCD into thinking they look different than they actually do. So... Uh, switch off all these like, kind of JPEG processing stuff. Uh, and again, color space, you can set it to whatever you want, really. The only thing is it's not going to affect the raw file. Again, the only thing it's going to affect is uh, what you're seeing on the screen and in Photo Mechanic. Uh, I don't change anything on this screen. Uh, focus options, uh, I've not really changed anything here. Obviously, I mentioned earlier that I use continuous autofocus. I've left everything else pretty much on the default settings, balance, balanced. Uh, flexible spot. I used a few different focus areas, like I mentioned, uh, but uh, yeah, there's nothing particularly you need to look, think about in that menu. Uh, or this one, really, like everything in here is just pretty much set on the on the defaults. The only thing I've changed in here is this AF with shutter. Turned that to off because I prefer to use back button focus instead of shutter button focus. So if you're a back button focuser, that's what you need to change to off. Uh, this is the default for tracking sensitivity number three. Pre-AF, again, you need to switch this off. This just does this weird thing where the camera will, it might shift the focus just before you take a picture because it thinks you're not in focus or you're not focused on the right thing. So anything that allows the camera to have its own brain, I, I tend to switch off. So pre-AF switched off. Uh, nothing else to bother about on that screen really. This is uh, the exposure stuff. I haven't changed anything on here. The only thing you might want to change if you, sh you shoot auto ISO is this is where you'd set your minimum shutter speed in auto ISO mode. Uh, all this stuff is kind of, um, Default, again, back button focuses are going to want to change this AEL with shutter to off. Flash, I haven't changed any of these settings because I only use manual flash, uh, white balance and image processing. The thing that you want to change on this screen is this DRO slash auto HDR to off. Again, it's one of those things that's it's only going to affect the JPEG and it's going to trick you into thinking your images are better exposed than they are. 
I mean, I had this switched on for the first wedding that I shot with this camera and the images look great in the viewfinder and on the screen. And then I get them home and everything was, once I imported it into Lightroom, everything was super dark because in the camera I'd been applying this auto HDR effect. So everything it, that brightened up shadows and things like that. So switch this off. I think it's evil. Switch it off. Uh, not change anything in here. Yeah, anti flicker is in this screen. That's where you'll switch it on or off. I've assigned it to custom menu that you'll see at the end. And also it's in the function button menu. Uh, movie modes, ignore that for now. S shutter and steady shot menu. Uh, silent shooting is generally switched off. Like I mentioned in the custom buttons, I have that assigned to a certain button if I ever want to switch it on. E front curtain shutter that we talked about earlier, switched on. Steady shot switched on. Uh, this is where you would set your, if you want to have grid lines in the viewfinder, I have a rule of thirds grid constantly shown in the viewfinder to help me with composition. Custom buttons here, which we talked about. Function menu setting is where you would set the any options that you want to come up when you hit the function button, which is this button on the back here, which brings up this menu at the bottom. So I've, I've only got a few options in there. I don't like to have too many options. Nothing else to think about here, really. I don't really use any of the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth options. Image index, which I'll talk about later as being a bit of a bugbear. Um, it's the only way you can scroll through multiple images at once is this image index. I have it set to 25 because then slightly less frustrating way of scrolling through images. I leave most things on auto, to be honest with you. Uh, monitor brightness and viewfinder brightness. Uh, it's not going to let me in those menus because I'm using a special monitor to record this. But basically, I find the monitor and viewfinder to be far too bright by default. So I have the viewfinder set on its minimum possible brightness and I have the monitor set on just one above minimum. Uh, and even then, I find the viewfinder slightly too bright compared to what I see on my computer screen. So uh, I would definitely recommend you set those to uh, minimum. Display quality, uh, I have it set on high uh, for no reason than why would you not have it set on the best possible quality. Think about, oh yeah, touch operation switched on. So earlier on when I talked about the touch screen and the touch pad, to make those work, you need to switch on touch operation. And then in this next menu where it says touch panel slash pad, uh, I have it set on touch panel and pad. You can either have it so that it only works with a uh, response to touch with the panel or the pad. Some people do this because uh, I mentioned that I use these eye cups to keep my face further away from the screen. If you find your face is always pressing the touch pad when you've got your eye to the viewfinder, you might want to switch off the pad and have it on touch panel only. But I have it set on touch panel and pad because I think the pad is so powerful. Touch pad settings is where you can kind of set to your own preferences which area of the screen you want to be the touchpad. So I have it set on whole screen. I just prefer it that way, but I've tried all the settings. You can have it set on to respond just on the right half of the screen, the right quarter, the upper right, lower right, blah, blah, blah. But I have it set on whole screen, but you have, have to play with that and see what works for you. Nothing else to think about in there really, or in here. Setup menus now, obviously date and time, things like copyright info, if you want to put your own name in. Uh, file number series, and, and then if you're using multiple bodies, you definitely want to give each body its own file name, otherwise it becomes a bit of a nightmare with file files with the same names when you get back into uh, and downloading images from weddings. So I've this camera is one AJ and the my other one is two AJ. Uh, so I definitely recommend having different file names per camera. Uh, the record media settings I'll talk about a little bit later on. Uh, folder name I've changed from standard form to date form. So any raw files on the memory cards will be in a folder just for that date. So it's if you do shoot multiple days on the same memory card, you can quickly go back to the folder that you want. Pretty much it. And then my menu at the end. So you've got pretty much unlimited options here to add your own options into a couple of custom menus at the end. So I've got things like creative style, anti-flicker, face registration, custom keys, cleaning mode, format, media settings, this live view display that I'll talk about later uh, and date and time. But you can add anything that you find yourself going back through the menus and kind of regularly looking for because there's so many menus that you can just think, where is that option? That You're just better off adding things to the, to the my menus at the end. Uh, and that's it really. So there's not that many options that you need to change, but the options that I've suggested in there will definitely make the shooting experience better. Okay, cool. So that's the setup of the camera. So now I'm going to um, talk about how it works and how it takes pictures. And we'll start with the showstopper, autofocus. Now it really feels to me like this camera has been built around insanely brilliant autofocus. And if you're shooting documentary, that's just a really, really good feeling to have about a camera. The main way that I judge a camera is that I need to be able to trust it implicitly to do what I'm expecting it to do when I pick uh, it up. And if I don't trust my camera to keep up with my instincts and my reflexes and to get stuff in focus, then I'll hesitate. And when, as soon as I hesitate, I'll miss stuff. And if you miss stuff, you'll get frustrated. And if I'm frustrated, then 
it all falls apart. So I was trying to think how I can best uh, sum up how good the autofocus system is on this camera. And I realized that I just don't check if my shots are in focus anymore, ever, because they are, all of them. <laughs> Pin sharp, whether I'm shooting at F8 or F1.4. Um, and now I shoot a lot of stuff with my lenses wide open since, since I've had this camera because I know it'll be in focus and I know it'll be sharp. And not only that, but it latches on so instantly that I'm definitely capturing moments more quickly that I, and probably moments that I would have missed with my old camera because it was just, I was waiting for it to focus or it wasn't latching on. Um, and a friend of mine, um, Sam Gibson, who's a, a brilliant wedding photographer down in Bristol, he did a review of this camera on his blog and he described the Sony a7 III as a moment machine. And I think that absolutely sums up the autofocus on this camera. If I can see something happening or something that's about to happen, then I point the camera, move the focus point with my touchpad, focus and I shoot in no time at all. And I get the shot and I get it in focus and I get it sharp every single time. Or if my camera isn't, you know, ready to shoot, then I've got that kind of get out of jail button that I talked about in the custom buttons, which I can just hit that and get and shoot and I'll get the shot. It might not be the exact aperture or, you know, all the settings that I might have chosen if it was my choice, but having that kind of get out of jail button is, well, it gets you out of jail. In terms of the settings that I have the focus system set on, there's a lot to choose from. Uh, as I mentioned in the menu options and the custom buttons, I have my camera set to back button focus using this top corner button here. Uh, I have it set on continuous autofocus or AFC mode, meaning that while my thumb is on that focus button or the eye autofocus button next to it, they'll continually refocus on whatever's under the focus square. The focus system I use most of the time is the expanded spot. Uh, I find it the most accurate and reliable of all the options and it suits the way that I shoot. So I do know that a lot of people rate the lock on AF mode, which uh, once you've focused on something, it will track that thing so long as you keep the focus button held. So however you recompose, so say you focused on a face or the bride walking down the aisle, the camera will will magically stay attached. Focus The focus will stay magically attached to the thing that you were originally focused on. As long as you keep the focus button held, however you recompose that shot, your focus will stay on the thing that you focused on. And that's pretty magical, but I don't, it doesn't suit the way that I shoot so much. Eye autofocus um, is, a revelation although like I mentioned earlier I tended in the end to not use it all that much because I don't find it quite as snappy as I'd like and I actually find I'm quicker with the touchpad or the touchscreen and the expand flexible spot focus mode but when you need to shoot quickly and you don't necessarily have time to focus and there isn't a face that you want in this in the frame hitting IAF uh, which, like I said, I've got mapped to this button here. And getting the shot in the bag, just having that feature there, again, it's just a really good feeling that the camera has all these kind of safety nets, like the IAF, like the get out of jail focus settings. It's just it's just a great, it just makes you feel good about using the camera. And you know you're not gonna really gonna miss stuff. There's no real reason to. Just very quickly, the only time that the expand flexible spot setting begins to struggle is when it's, starting to get really dark. So dance floors or outdoors, that kind of thing. So I'll normally at that point switch to the flexible spot M or flexible spot L, as they seem to work a little bit better in low light. That's a good way to move on to talking about ISO. This camera is astounding with its quality at high ISO. It's genuinely unbelievable. Yeah, it's noisy, but it's clean noise and the images are sharp and with good color and depth and tone and it blows my mind. Okay, the final piece of the shooting system we're talking about is the drive modes. Now the a Sony a7 III is capable of 10 frames per second in its fastest continuous shooting mode called high plus and eight frames per second in the high mode, which I use all the time. Gotta say, I had no idea how many frames per second it was capable of until I was writing this review uh, because well, who cares? But all I know is it's ridiculously quick, much quicker than my old Canon. Uh, but if numbers is what matters to you, then it's capable of 10 frames per second. Um, if you want it that fast, I don't want it that fast, so I use eight frames per second. The amazing thing about this as well is that even continually shooting eight frames per second, I hardly ever hit the buffer limit. I use fast SD cards uh, and it starts to buffer for me at about 60 or so full-size RAW files. I've hit that on a few occasions, bearing in mind I've shot uh, 25 weddings, it's only two or three times I've really hit the buffer. Uh, whereas on Canon, I was hitting the buffer every single week. And often I was having to, disable one of the memory cards just to make sure it didn't buffer um, for things like confetti shots. What's also pretty cool is 
in the viewfinder, you can see how many photos are in the buffer right now, which sometimes it's just, I mean, it's useful to see, but sometimes it's just a reminder to slow down a bit and stop being so trigger happy um, and let the camera catch up. Let's quickly talk about memory cards uh, and settings around that. The a7 III has two card slots, which I think is vitally important to wedding photographers. This camera has a few options of how you can use uh, each card and both cards and how you can write images to the cards. Uh, but I just have it on the simultaneous mode, so it's writing all my JPEGs and all my RAWs to both cards. Final thing I want to talk about is flash and using flash with these cameras. I use a, quite a lot of flash at weddings in the speeches and the parties. So it was really important to me that this camera would work with and not just work with, but perform well when using flash. And the revelation for me was that I've tried my old Canon triggers and they just worked. And that was amazing. So the triggers fit the hot shoe and they fire my flashes. And because I only use simple manual flashes, that was enough for me. Uh, I haven't tested it with any more sophisticated flashes or flashes that specifically fit the Sony hot shoe, which has a funny name. I can't remember what it is. I'm happy with simple manual flash. So I haven't tested any other triggers or flashes with these cameras. So I can't comment on any of that. What you do have to do when you do it the way I'm doing it is you have to use a small workaround and that is to override the EVF because the EVF by default shows a true view of the picture you're about to take. So, so whatever settings you've got dialed into the camera, that's what you'll see the result of in your EVF. And you don't always want that when you're using flash because Often I'm underexposing the ambient light. So sometimes I'm underexposing it so that it's basically complete darkness so that the only light in the scene eventually with the picture will be the flash. So that means the screen and the viewfinder are just black. And that's obviously not ideal for taking pictures. So the setting that you need to change if you're using flash the way that I do in the camera settings menu, uh, it's camera settings menu two, screen six, and it's called live view display. When you're using flash, you want to set that to uh, setting effect off. And that'll turn your screen and your viewfinder into full on night vision and let you see what's going on. Uh, and it won't pay any attention to the settings you've got dialed in. That's everything I know about how I use the Sony a7 III. But I will finish off by talking about a few of the things that annoy me um, and the stuff that I wish this camera was better at. It's going to be a short list, but I will talk about it anyway. I mentioned earlier that I wish the LCD was tiltier and flippier but that's a minor gripe and I'm sure future models will have that. The silent mode is definitely a letdown, but realistically, uh, I guess there need to be reasons why the A9 costs so much more. Uh, what I really, really miss is the ability that I used to have on my Canon to scroll quickly through the images on the memory card. I used to be able to, you, on Canon you can set a setting where it'll either skip 10 or 100 at a time using the top wheel. Uh, and the Sony just doesn't have that option. The only option, on the Sony is to go one at a time or to use like a film strip view. And it's just, neither of them is, is good for looking through large amounts of photos at all. So I really hope Sony are listening and they introduce a change to that in future firmware. The other thing I don't understand is why when you set the date and time on these cameras, you've only got control of the hours and the minutes. So you can't set the seconds. And that means that syncing up the camera time between two different bodies is annoying and fiddly. And I'm hoping again that Sony will fix that with firmware. The only other slight annoyance is that the thumb wheel on the back of the camera is feels too sensitive sometimes. And when I'm, sometimes when I'm changing aperture, I end up going into ISO or drive mode or white balance accidentally. But but yeah, the, the, that's just slightly annoying about the thumb wheel. But it's the trade off is you get you get to customize all the buttons around that wheel. So I'm happy to accept that. It's really genuinely the camera that I always wish existed, and now it exists, and I'm so happy that. I decided to make the leap of faith from Canon when I did do at the beginning of this wedding season. I think it's the perfect camera for weddings. And the best thing, the best thing is it inspires me to want to take photos and to experiment creatively. And for a working photographer, that is the amber nectar. And if you've been thinking of making the switch from, especially from the more traditional old school DSLR Canons and Nikons, then all I have to say is, what are you waiting for? This is the perfect camera for wedding photography. The A9 will allow you to use silent mode as much as you want, but you would lose anti-flicker, which is a real bonus of this camera. And you would also lose an extra couple of thousand pounds from your bank account. So it's something you have to decide to do. Thanks for listening. Uh, if you do want to see uh, sample images from this camera, I'm going to be putting some of those on the Nine Dots blog, which you can see at uh, this link, nine dots co slash nine dots zine. Any questions, pop them in the comments. And before you go, please hit subscribe. See you later.